Hi, I'm Roman Kalyan from the Microsoft 365 product marketing team. And I'm Talamir uh, from the security and compliance engineering team. All right, welcome to episode one where we're talking about uh, using artificial intelligence to hunt for insider risk within your organization. Talal, we're going to be talking to Robert McCann today. Yeah, looking forward to this. Robert's been here for 15 years. Crazy smart guy, he's an applied researcher, a principal applied researcher at Microsoft, and he's been a core partner of ours, leading a lot of the work in the data science and the research space. So in this podcast, we'll go deeper into what are some of the, the challenges we're coming across, how we're planning to tackle some of those challenges, and what they mean in terms of driving impact uh, with the product itself. I'm excited. Let's do it. Let's get it. Robert has uh, been focused on the insider uh, risk space for us for, Robert, how long have you been in this space now? Uh, I've been doing science for about 15 years at Microsoft. Uh, insider risk, about a year, I think, Tala, something like that. Yep. Nice. And so what, what sort of your, what's your background? Uh, so I am an applied researcher at Microsoft. Um, I've been working on various forms of security for many years. Um, you can see all the gray in here. That's from yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. um, so I've done some communication security, uh, like uh, email filtering or attachment, email attachment filtering. Um, I've done some protecting Microsoft accounts or users' accounts, a lot of reputation work. And then the last few years, I've been on uh, – ATP products, so basically babysitting corporate networks, uh, looking to see if anybody got through the the, the security protections, uh, post breach stuff. So that's a lot of like uh, machine learning models across that whole stack. Uh, the post breach thing is a lot about looking for suspicious behaviors on networks or suspicious processes. Um, and then uh, the last year or so, uh, I wanted to try to contribute to the insider threat space. What does it mean to be an insider or to be an applied researcher? Uh, an applied researcher, uh, that's a propeller head. So we all know what propeller heads are. <laughs> uh, basically, I get to go around and talk to product teams, um, figure out their problems, uh, and then go try to do science on it and try to come up with technical solutions. Um, you know, AI is a big word. Uh, there's a lot of different things that we do under that umbrella. Uh, a lot of supervised learning, uh, a lot of unsupervised learning um, to get insights and to ship detectors. So I basically get to do experiments, see how things would work, uh, and then try to tech transfer to a product. So you said you spent most of your time in the external security space. Thinking That's about right. Like, things like phishing, ransomware, people trying to attack you know, us from the outside. Um, how is how is insider threat different? Like, what have uh, you found like to be, wow, this isn't what I expected, or here's some challenges, or here's some cool stuff that I think I could apply? Yeah, it's a very cool space, number one, because it's very hard from a scientist's perspective, uh, which, which I enjoy. Um, so the first thing that you hit on, that's really the, the, sort of fundamental first thing that makes it hard is that they're already inside. They're already touching assets. People are doing their normal work. Uh, and the inside threat might not even be uh, malicious. It might be inverted. Uh, so it's this very challenging thing. It's different than trying to protect a perimeter. It's trying to sort of watch all this normal behavior inside uh, and look for any place that anybody might be doing anything that's concerning from an a internal assets perspective. So when you think about like somebody doing something challenging, is it just like, hey, I've downloaded a bunch of files? Because today I might download a bunch of files, and tomorrow I might just go back to my normal file thing. But if I look across like an organization the size of Microsoft, that's 200,000 people, um, that could probably produce a lot of noise, right? So how do you kind of filter through that? So actually, the solutions that right now in the product and what we're trying to leverage to improve the product are built on a lot of AI things. So there's very sophisticated algorithms that try to take uh, documents and classify what's in those documents. Um, or P our customers might go and label documents, and then you try to use those labels to classify more documents. There's a lot of, a lot of very sophisticated uh, sort of deep, uh, deep learning, natural language processing stuff that, that we leverage. Uh, and those are very strong signals to try to 
to see, okay, this, this behavior over here, that's not so concerning, but this behavior right here, that's a big deal. Now we need to fire an alert. Or maybe it's a little more of a deal, but then I sort of got some sentiment based on what, how the person's doing, the employee. Uh, if I combine those things, now, now it becomes compelling. Uh, it's, it's a very hard noise reduction problem. As you were talking, Robert, one thing that sort of you know occurred to me is I've had conversations with customers, and and you mentioned this around um, leveraging you know artificial intelligence and learning and helping the system learn. A lot of questions I get from from customers is like you know what is artificial intelligence in this context, and and how do I how do I know that you know this is something that I should trust, or how is it different than maybe what I'm doing today? I've seen this play out time and time again on many, many times that a sort of a security team has tried to start leveraging AI to do smart detections. It's a very different game. It's not, um, it's not I have precise detection criteria, and if you satisfy that, then I understand what I did and I understand the detection. It is a very uh, statistical machine that sometimes you have to assume it's going to make mistakes. So one key thing you need to be able to do to trust that machine is you need to measure how well it's doing. So you have to have a way to babysit the thing, basically. Um, and you have to set your expectations to understand that there is error going to happen, but there has to be an error bar met. So that's basically what you're babysitting against. Um, another very key thing is when it fires a detection, that thing can't be opaque. It needs to explain how in the heck or why in the heck it thinks that this thing uh, is a threat. Right. So the deep learning folks uh, uh, like for image classification or natural language uh, processing uh, uh, work, they sort of jumped on board real fast uh, with the deep learning thrust without without really worrying too much about uh, being able to explain why that thing was was classifying images the way it was. Right. Uh, and they were ecstatic because they're getting so much better results than they've gotten like the decade before. Right. But then it came to the point where they started realizing, hey, I can game this thing uh, and, and I'll prove it to you. And then, you know, you take a picture and you change a few pixels and then I make that thing classify the cat as somebody else. Uh, when you use a camera for uh, uh, detecting people, um, facial recognition and identity verification, that becomes a serious problem. So they sort of went into this. Um, phase now, and it's very hot right now, um, can you do these sophisticated models that also can you can explain why they did what they did? Uh, and so there's a ton of science and a ton of work trying to crack open the black boxes, right? Those big sophisticated learners. But you don't have to go to that phase. There's all this other AI that works uh, very, very well and is very effective. And I would say is probably the most common stuff that's used and delivers the most value in industry that's not so opaque and you can you the models are simple enough or i guess opaque enough or, or uh they're explainable enough that you can tell a customer i detected this threat because this and this and this happened right yeah. um so explainability is very key to try and to trust ai and that brings up the uh, another sort of key question we get from customers a lot and it looks like you're you know, this, this idea of transparency in the model or the explainability in the model is a, is a key attribute, right? So it looks like we're learning from, you know, years and years of kind of data science and research in this space um, to apply that into the models that we build. So can you talk about that a little bit? So in insider risk, what do you think constitutes a good model? What kind of explainability should be in that model so we can help our customers make the right decision on whether something is bad or not? Well, you have to put on the customer hat, uh, which sometimes is hard as a scientist. Like a scientist might be satisfied saying if the explanation for some prediction by some model is, you know, the feature 32 um, was this far away from a margin. OK, so there's some, some technical explanations why a classification might happen. Um, but the customer, they just want to know, you know, what are the actually human actions that, that cause that? you got to have a model where you can and simple enough features where you can boil it down and say, this person's suspicious because they printed this document that's highly confidential, and then they did it again two days later, and then they did it again three days later, and then they did it again four days later. And you have to have that very human intelligible um, output from your model, which is something that is very easy 
to skip if, if yeah. you don't have explainability top of mind. You have yeah. to pick the appropriate technologies. Because yeah, it's really about trying to abstract away all the science behind the scenes, right? It should just be, we should just be able to easily explain to the customer, here's what we saw. How we detected it should be irrelevant to them. Here's what is happening with this potential actor. Let's go make the decision on how to manage that risk. Yeah, and I think that's the, that is the sort of the key here, right? As you think about, um, there's the tech, which is how do I detect, try to detect these things? Yeah. And then there's the person consuming the output of the yeah. tech, right? And the, typically, the person consuming the output of the tech um, is, is, is somebody who may be in HR, maybe in legal, maybe they're, yeah, they could be a security analyst, but they have to interface with HR and legal. And, and, and you know, uh, they may not be as sophisticated. Like, I'll, you know, like, I'm not, I'm technical, but I'm not as technical, obviously, as Robert, mm -hmm. even probably you. And so I don't want to go deep dive into some algorithm to try to figure out, like, well, what's going on here? I want to just know, like, hey, the risk score of this individual is high, um, and here's the related activity that that the system found, um, and and this is why you should kind of believe it. Yeah. In fact, we've seen this from our customers. We've seen this in our own experience in that uh, the people that have to make the timely and informed decision on how to manage insider risk is oftentimes the business or HR or legal. Right. Right? They don't want to get into the technical details behind the model that was used or this, that, or whatnot. They just need something that's um, that's easy to understand in business terms so they can make that uh, make that determination on what needs to happen. Ram and I were just on a call with a customer earlier this week, and they raised this question on why can't we do supervised learning for these detectors? So I'd love to get your thoughts on some of the challenges or maybe some of the opportunities or how you're looking at the types of learning models that you use for these detectors. One of the challenges is how much context it needs. And if you want labels, you got to be able to take and give that context to the customer when they have alerts, right? They need to be able to accurately say, hey, this alert's right. And, and it's easy for me to tell that and I can do it in an efficient way because the product just gave me an explanation. Now, once you're able to sort of explain yourself and you're supposed to and you're able to give it to the customers uh, so they can efficiently triage. Now you're starting to crack open this sort of virtuous cycle where they can start giving you labels and you can pull them back in house and you can start learning how to do supervised classification on this stuff. Um, it's very key. You, you need this sort of label generation mechanism, right? Um, so that that's key for, for opening supervised learning, but it's also key in that uh, insider threats can be very subjective. So one tenant can want to see the same activity and another tenant might say, ah, that's not important to me. Don't tell me that, please. That's noise, right? So now you got to be able to do classification that's customized per tenant, right? And, and the, each tenant doesn't want to go in and fiddle with all your AI and make it work just right for them. An easier way for them to express what they want is to give you feedback. So we explain detections. They give us feedback, and now we can start learning, okay, supervised model works for these types of customers. This other supervised model works for these types of customers. And then we can sort of get this customization game going as well. But, but all of that and all of those supervised learning techniques, they rely on labels. Uh, and you got to do a good job explaining to your customers to get that feedback. One question, uh, Robert, so I also get is around um, – Today, a lot of the tools or a lot of my, my uh, detection capabilities are reactionary. I got fired um, or I'm not happy and I downloaded a bunch of stuff and I'm out of here. I resign, right? But prior to that, maybe a month prior or maybe it's four months prior or even three weeks prior, there might have been some activity that was happening that might have indicated that I was about to do it. Can you help me predict? Can you help me be more proactive? And I think, again, I, I go back to like, this could be, this is a spectrum of things, right? Um, we're not going to know like today is the law bad tomorrow? Probably not, right? But it could be like, hey, review time's coming up. 
didn't get the bonus he wanted. He's been working on insider risk for the last, you know, two years. And now it's like, okay, I'm out of here, man. I'm going to go somewhere else. So I guess the the big question I, I, I want to ask is like, how do we how do we answer that for question for customers right um, when they ask us that what would be your answer? There, there's something here, and, and Roman, I th- I think you you sort of hinted at it is that there's past behavior that we could look at and we could say okay from our past experience this sort of sequence like 10 percent of the time it end up with something that we didn't like so if we see that in the future let's do that again so actually you know on the technical side we're doing a lot of work on sequential uh, pattern mining um and it boils down to just that what are sequences of activity based on the type of context that tala mentions it might be sentiment or it might be something else um that tend to lead up to things that in hindsight, we know we're bad. Okay, so we're gonna use that to predict in the future. But there's also stuff we, you know, that maybe we didn't see before. So maybe we also look for, here's some machinery that to say, here's sequences that are totally abnormal. Well, let's go get somebody on them and let's look at that and let's start get that labeling loop going on that so we can understand if that sequence is good or bad. So in the future, we can protect other people with the same observations. But your question about preemptiveness is a, is a good one. And I think sort of the sequential mining uh, aspect, very fun from a technical standpoint, and I think it'd be very valuable for our customers, for sure. Because I think that, you know, what this is highlighting for me from a tech perspective, you know, and I'm a marketing guy, so, you know, I'm about selling it, selling the story. But as I think about this, what, what becomes very clear to me is that you can't just use one thing, one signal can't just be like, oh, somebody is on an endpoint and they tried to copy something in a USB and that might be bad. There is multiple things going on, right? There's sentiment analysis. There might be, you know, other activity. It's who they're talking to, how many times they're trying to access stuff. Did they come into a building when they shouldn't have been in the building? All of these different elements can come into play. And and to, you know, Tala's earlier point, you know, it's really about like, uh, because we're dealing with employees, you have to, you can't assume that everybody is bad, right? Mm. It could be like, wow, I couldn't get, I couldn't get my PC to turn on at home, so now I got to go to the office and do it there. Maybe that was in the middle of the night. I don't know, you know. So, but uh, I think that's the big challenge in this space, from my perspective, is that you just can't rely on one set of signals. It has to be multiple signals and. And the machine and the machine learning is key to sort of really driving an exposure of like, this could be something that you might want to take a closer look at. You're always going to have a human element, I guess. Right? Well, that's absolutely true. In fact, this reminds me, there's a, a, when we're sort of establishing the program at the company, there was you know, a lot, we had a whole virtual team put together and we're trying to kind of ground ourselves on a principle. And one of the guys on the on the team actually proposed something that just stuck, which is you know, this program should be built on the principle of assume positive intent, but maintain healthy skepticism. What that effectively means is you just follow the data. That's it. Don't start off thinking some, everybody's bad. Don't start off thinking you're going to catch bad guys. This is about looking at the data, as much of the data, as much of the context to Rob's point, and just follow that until you get to a point where it's like, this looks odd, this looks potentially risky. Right. And then you take that information, you surface it for the business with the right context, right explainability in the model so that they can make the decision. I think presenting that in a way that allows you to make that informed decision um, mm-hmm. is does two things. One, it gives you the ability to kind of say, hey, this might be bad for me. But two, it also allows you to filter out the noise to say, hey, not everything is bad. Because what I also hear is I, you know, I'm, I'm done with, let's imagine like using a, a data loss prevention tool to try to detect insider risk, right? That's, that's challenging because A, that's just one set of signals. It's a very siloed approach and B, you're gonna you're gonna be you know overwhelmed with a ton of alerts because it's very rules based, right? Not necessarily yeah. using all this machine learning type of stuff. Yeah. So how do you prevent alert fatigue? And I think that's where you need this combination of signals to not only look at what might be potentially you know a problematic, but present it in a way that you can then make that informed decision. 
so Rob, you know, one of the things that, you know, as as we look forward, you know, there's a number of uh, there's a number of different types of detections that we could, you know, potentially, you know, look at. You know, one is uh, sequential modeling. That's that's an interesting one, and would love for you to explain about that. Um, the other one is around, you know, this concept of low and slow. Um, from what I understand, it's it's not about this big burst of I come in today, I download a thousand files, and I'm out of here. It's more of over the next six months, I'm I'm now a little bit irritated, and over the next six months, I'm going to download a file here, a file there, ten files here. Um, I'd love for you to kind of deep dive into that. Yeah, I mean, those are those are the really interesting cases, right? Those are the the people that are being very stealthy, right? And the people that we want to try to detect. Um, it's a little bit different of a game. Uh, so, like you said, the bursty stuff. I mean, uh, is did they did they do something abnormal to themselves, or or did they go over some globally agreed upon threshold that this thing is just bad behavior, right? That's a different game than looking at somebody who's trying to stay under the radar and taken long term. Um, you got to model things a little differently. Number one, you got to look at longer history. I'm not looking at bursts of uh, daily activity. I'm looking at what they've done in the long term. So now you have engineering issues because you got to have the scale to look at everybody's rich, long history. Um, but then after you get that, okay, I'm monitoring somebody. It's very hard to tell. I mean, you've looked at, you know, stock market charts where there's two very flat. How do you tell the difference between two flat lines where one's a good investment and one's not a good investment? It's it's hard because it's low and it's slow, right? The, the behavior is subtle. One thing that we're looking at is uh, how can we tighten the screws when we do anomaly detection, right? So it's easy to tighten anomaly detection to the level of detecting a burst, okay? You can do that, right? Now we want to tighten anomaly detection to the point we can pick out two flat lines and tell the difference from good behavior and bad behavior, right? What is what does normal mean? I mean, normal's got to be right in between those two. How do we find that normal, right? Uh, so the way the way that we're doing that is we're modeling people based upon what's normal for groups of similar employees, right? Does this employee? How tight can we say what's normal behavior for devs, so that we can have a model that looks at low and slow normal work behavior for devs, and low and slow little bit worse than normal behavior for devs, and pick that apart. So you just got to you just got to do tighter anomaly detection. You got to compare them to groups that's going to give you um, uh, a definition of normal behavior that's tight enough that you're going to be able to pick out, even though they're low and slow, you're going to be able to pick out the different behavior over a long period of time. So Rob, just for just a couple of fun things on the side. So being a long-term researcher, what are some of the pet peeves or some of the things that really have annoyed you about maybe some of the product pitches you've seen or they maybe over promise or, or the way they position AI or ML. I'd love to hear some of the stories that you have um, and what just kind of just gives you the shivers. As scientists, we have a community and we go talk to each other and you, you get to know people and, and you, you figure out what's really behind that magic sauce. And, and, and sometimes it's not as impressive sounding as the marketing. So that, that means the marketing's doing a good job, I guess, right? Um, but uh, that's sort of a pet peeve from a scientist standpoint. I mean, good signs that you should see to sort of prove that stuff out is you, you should see scientific activity. If they say they're doing good science, they probably have scientists uh, working for them. Uh, and if they have scientists working for them, then those scientists like to do things like publish or make patents or go out and do conference. You should see some scientific evidence happening there. Uh, I think that's sort of a telltale sign. Uh, so that's one pet peeve, overselling how much is going on there. Um, another pet peeve is this idea that machine learning or AI is a magic bullet that you just throw stuff at and it magically gives you exactly what you want. Um, it doesn't work that way. Computers are basically just big, really fast calculators, right? And we've figured out some algorithms that they can look at some data and pick out some patterns quickly. Um, but that's what they are. They're pattern finders. Uh, and uh, the scientific community has been clever in how they take that sort of big, fancy calculator and put it into making some business decisions that are crucial uh, and stitching them together like we talked about, you know, here's 
Here's a module that does sentiment analysis, big fancy calculator, right? Uh, here's a module that does um, uh, confidentiality of the file, big fancy calculator. And then there's all this business stuff that comes in that has to stitch that together to make a good decision. It's not just the AI. It's the stitching together in the appropriate ways that solves your business problem that's really the magic sauce, right? Uh, so that's another pet peeve. Like, you just throw stuff at AI and then you suddenly got a million dollar business. It doesn't work that way. You got to put these components together and work hard on them because they're challenging. Um, but you got to stitch them together correctly. It's the whole ecosystem. And that's actually a, that's an interesting point, Robert. I mean, I like that because it's like, because in a way, what you say is like, okay, I took these, like imagine I'm I'm creating clothing, right? And I've got different types of fabric, different types of zippers, and I stitch it together and I produce it. And it's like, hey, here you go. Here's your shirt. And uh, somebody says, you know, I, I don't like it that way. I want to be able to stitch it in a different way. And uh, or if new fabric comes out, I'm going to use that in new types of clothing. And I think this is what to me is interesting about what you just said, which is you've got these different calculators that are looking at different parts of the puzzle, right? Taking different signals in. And then the, the secret sauce is how do you stitch together to produce something that, that you might want to consider as being an anomaly or abnormal behavior, but then be able to provide feedback back into that calculator to say, hey, I didn't like that or this didn't work for me stitched together somewhat differently. Yeah, you're right on. I mean, um, there's like I, like we talked before about how do you trust these black boxes? Uh, it's all that logic that babysets it. And like you got to have some guardrails in there so the thing doesn't go off the rail and mess up with everything else that you're stitching together. It's that sort of business logic on top that's super, super valuable and, and just – just as impressive to me as the AI under the hood, to tell you the truth. So, Robert, appreciate you being here today. This has been great, great conversation on the tech. As you think about, you know, the future and where we go from here, where we see ourselves, you know, uh, in, in five years from now, what are your sort of projections in terms of what might be different than what we have today? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, I, th I think some of the big thing is, uh, you know, solve these sort of um, challenging tweaks, which is like, um, you know, Tala mentioned multi-users. We do, we solve multi-users. Uh, we we get good we get good enough anomaly detection that we can pick off the low and slow, even differentiate that. Um, but I, I think one thing would be super powerful to get to is if we get this sort of feedback coming, right? Because once you get this feedback loop coming, then you crack open the AI door for all, all kinds of algorithms. There's a lot more supervised stuff that, that we could use and we could leverage uh, that would, would make us even more powerful, which would give better detectors to people, which would give us more labels to get even more powerful. And when you sort of get that sort of mutual synergy going, um, I think the detections, they skyrocket. And then one other thing, like the industry is, is not really um, – um, has a really like like external tax space. Uh, industry has these threat matrices, right? And they sort of have this benchmarks that they're trying to work against. And they're they're writing down uh, simple rules to detect that, and they're using sophisticated eye targeted at known bad behaviors. I would like to see that sort of landscape roadmap uh, start happening in insider threat space as well, because it's going to prioritize what we do from a product standpoint and also from a research standpoint. And it's going to be an input to our models. Hey, this is known bad stuff. We better be able to detect that, uh, stitch things together to detect those sequences. Thanks again for being here. Tala, uh, always good to talk to you, man. And uh, I know we have another episode coming up with, uh, I think it's Dan Costa from the Carnegie Mellon, right? That's right. Looking forward yeah. to that very much. And uh, Robert, again, appreciate it, man. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much, Rob. Yeah. Thanks, Robert. Thank Thanks for inviting me. Tell Dan I said hi. Yeah, well. Tala, that was an amazing conversation with Robert, man. That guy is like surreal. I told you. I know. It's amazing. Well, if you enjoyed this, we got another podcast coming up with Dan Costa from the CERT Institute at Carnegie Mellon. 
Dan is engaging with a lot of players like the NSA and Secret Service, so it's going to be great. Definitely uh, subscribe and, and continue listening.